Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Janopoulos, also known as Dr. Stephen G. Welcome to my YouTube page where I'm going to be explaining how I look at thyroid function or how to better understand your own thyroid. First of all, why is it even important to understand your own thyroid? You're not a doctor after all, and we're not here to teach you to become one. However, if we look at the thyroid and what it does, it's super important because you're all kind of Googling out there your different symptoms and seeing what the Google machine is going to spit out as being a possible problem. And the overwhelming majority of chronic symptoms result in findings that include thyroid function. I want to explain why. And so many millions and millions of people are taking thyroid medication. And we want to dispel some myths and kind of bring you up to speed on what you need to know. So like I said, we're not here to teach you to become a doctor, but we are here to teach you to become an expert in yourself and what you need to know to improve your health. And also, what can you do for yourself, right? Your doctors are there to help you, typically by giving medication if necessary when it comes to thyroid health, but what can you do for yourself? And that's what we're going to discuss here. So first of all, what is your thyroid? Well, it's a, a shield shaped organ sitting right here in the front of your neck. And the word thyroid actually means shield in Greek or ancient Greek. So what your thyroid does is it makes a hormone and we call it T4. Now 90s, 3% of what it makes is T4. 7% of what it makes is called T3. T3 is actually the active form of the hormone. T4 is thyroid hormone. It's kind of the, the travel form of the hormone, so to speak. Thyroid makes T4. It doesn't really do anything goes into your bloodstream, it travels around where it will get converted when it gets where it needs to go into T3 and T3 actually has the impact. Now I'm bringing this up because every single cell in the human body from your hair to your toenails and everything in between has receptors for thyroid hormone or T3 and therefore it affects how each of those cells uses energy and that's super important to you. And that also explains why every chronic symptom, no matter what system system of your body we're talking about, whether it be a pain, joints, digestion, brain, heart, lungs, kidneys, it doesn't matter. All of them require a healthy thyroid activity. So if your thyroid is not working, you're not going to last very long without thyroid hormone. And that's why they've come up with medications for it. So many people don't have the ability anymore to make thyroid hormone. So with that being said, the main idea here is we want to understand what's the best way to ensure that we not only can make thyroid hormone, but that we're making the right amount of thyroid hormone, and then that we're able to convert the thyroid hormone into the active form. So the brain tells the thyroid to get to work. The thyroid gets to work by making T4. T4 circulates around your body, gets converted into T3. That T3 conversion requires certain nutrients. We'll discuss those. And it requires the activity of certain systems in the body. So for example, your liver converts about 60% of your T4 into T3. Your digestive system converts about 20% of T4 into T3. And then your muscles and nerves and the activity of your body converts the rest of the 20% from T4 to T3. So we want to make sure, again, that whole system is able to work the way it's supposed to. All right. This conversation is different for people with thyroid symptoms and without diagnosed hypothyroidism, which means low thyroid function. And it's different for people who are diagnosed with hypothyroidism, meaning lab tests were done. Their production of T4 is low. Their brain is screaming, hey, thyroid, make more, make more, make more, right? The TSH is going up. Thyroid stimulating hormone goes up because T4 is not being produced. So the more you you need T4, the higher the TSH or the thyroid stimulating hormone goes up. And that by definition is hypothyroidism. So typically someone is given a medication, either a bioidentical T4, T3 combination or a synthetic T4 or a synthetic T3. So there are different versions of all of these medications. So first, what we want to do, again, we're not here to be your doctor or to make any recommendations for prescribing, but what we want to do is give you an understanding. So I'm going to use my iPad and we're going to draw some of this out to make it totally understandable so that you can take action. Now, what's the number one reason people have hypothyroidism in the United States? It, the answer is autoimmune disease. It's the most 
common autoimmune disease in the country. It's called Hashimoto's. Hashimoto was a doctor, a Japanese doctor who discovered this process, and that's where you have antibodies. Your immune system creates an attack on your thyroid gland, on specific enzymes. They have names like thyroglobulin and thyroid peroxidase. So TPO and thyroglobulin antibodies are created. The immune system sees these antibodies. They're, think of them as flags, right? They're an antibody. It's like a flag being stuck on your thyroid, and that flag is waving in the air, telling the immune system to come and gobble it up. So this is like the universal sign for, for Pac-Man, right? The immune system is going to come and see that signal and gobble it up. Why would your body even do that? Why would you signal an attack to yourself? And the reason why we would signal an attack on ourselves is because the immune system makes a mistake. Why would the immune system make a mistake? Well, typically, I'm going to draw this out for you. It starts with an immune system that's hyper-responsive because of repetitive insults. Those insults can be anything from viruses and bacteria and parasites and things of that nature, or they can be environmental toxicities, or they can be foodstuffs or food products. In particular, food products that have been somewhat adulterated so that the immune system cannot necessarily recognize that food stuff should not be something that we attack. So usually it starts with a hyperimmune response to something we shouldn't necessarily be attacking, in particular food, and then the immune system continues to dysfunction all the way to the point where it creates an autoimmunity. So I'll draw that out for us on the iPad. So once we understand this system, we're going to have to go through a little bit about what to do about it. So let's go ahead onto the iPad and draw out what we're looking to understand when it comes to thyroid function. All right. Let's see if I remember how to use this iPad program here. So we start with the brain, which communicates to a gland under the brain called the pituitary, which communicates to your thyroid gland in your neck. The brain tells the pituitary what it needs. So think of this as being the CEO of the factory. It's determining what the factory needs. The CEO is going to tell the factory manager specifically what it wants from the thyroid gland, and the thyroid is the factory worker. So the brain tells the manager what it needs, the manager tells the thyroid what's expected, and the thyroid is the worker that produces its product in the factory called T4. Now, T4 is going to go down to your liver, here's a good looking liver, your digestive system, right, there's your stomach, your intestines, so liver, digestion, and then we'll say your muscles, joints, and nerves, muscles and nerves. These are going to take that T4 and convert it into T3. T3 will then go into the cell, affect the DNA, and that cell will then be able to function and create the energy that it needs. This happens in virtually every single cell in the human body. Okay, that's the mechanism. Where do things go wrong? Well, if there's poor communication between the manager and the thyroid, so if thyroid stimulating hormone is low, then we're also going to have low T4, and that's called secondary hypothyroidism. It happens, but it's less common. What's more common is primary hypothyroid, where the TSH goes up because the manager is getting angry. It's like, hey, thyroid, we need more T4. And the thyroid, the worker is like, yeah, okay, I'm kind of lazy right now and I'm not really working very hard. So what happens is TSH goes up because the manager of the factory is just getting angrier and angrier and yelling louder and louder and trying to get the T4 to work harder. The worker is trying, but really not putting in as much of an effort or it doesn't have the resources it needs and therefore it can't produce T4. And that's called primary hypothyroid. That means the problem is with the thyroid, with the worker. In secondary hypothyroid, the problem is with the pituitary, possibly even the message coming from the brain. So those are the two different types. If your T4 
TSH is elevated above the reference range, you're diagnosed with primary hypothyroidism, and you are given medication. If it's secondary hypothyroidism, then your TSH is going to be not elevated. If your TSH is not elevated, and most doctors only check TSH because that tells the doctor whether or not you need medication, if the TSH is normal, most doctors just leave it there. They don't even check the T4. And even if the T4 is low and they check it, if the TSH is low or normal, well, they don't give thyroid medication for that. Now, that's typically the way it works. Now, I'm not an endocrinologist, nor do I play one on television, but this is what we're seeing clinically. Okay, now let's go to why would the thyroid stop functioning? What is going to cause this system to not work the way it's supposed to? What's going to stop the thyroid from working? And the answer most commonly for most of you is autoimmunity. If the thyroid gland is being attacked by the Pac-Men and those Pac-Men are chewing on the thyroid gland, it's not going to be able to make its T4. It's just not going to be able to do it. No matter how high the TSH goes, no matter how high it goes, the T4 is not going to go up because the thyroid gland is just rendered useless over time. Okay. What if you have the Pac-Men, you have the antibodies, but the thyroid still works? And that's very common. People will have elevated thyroid antibodies, but their TSH is normal. Their T4 is normal. Their T3 is normal. They don't need anything, but they're making antibodies. So they're diagnosed with Hashimoto's autoimmune reaction without hypothyroid. And then you say, well, what does that mean, doctor? And the doctor says nothing. Uh, eventually, your thyroid will crap out. But in the meantime, keep going about your business. We'll keep checking it. Once your TSH goes up above a certain level, then we have medication for you, and you can take that for the rest of your life. And that's the basic system that we currently have medically. All right. So let's now talk about autoimmunity and how it happens. Let's see if I can be an artist here. There's an attractive profile. Okay. Okay. So here we have food enters your mouth, goes into your stomach, travels down, goes into your stomach. Hydrochloric acid is produced to break down the food particles, so the food particles get released into the small intestines. And then we're just going to blow up the small intestine here. And what we have are blood vessels on either side of the intestinal cells. Okay. So the food particles are broken down in the stomach and released into the small intestines where those food particles will cross the nutrition I should say the broken down food products becomes nutrition, gets into our bloodstream, and that's how we deliver nutrition into our body. But some of these food particles are large, large undigested food particles that are supposed to travel through and be excreted down the other side here. However, sometimes there can be a disruption in the integrity of the cell wall and these large undigested food particles can get into the bloodstream. And when they get into the bloodstream, the immune system says, hey, that food particle, you know, it looks a little bit different than uh, other food particles that I've seen. So the immune system's attention is going to be brought 
into this area. So whenever we eat food, the immune system is always hanging out. It's kind of like the security. You got to have security, right? If the outside world is your food and the inside world is your bloodstream, what protects the inside world from the outside world is the immune system right here in your small intestines. So the outside world, it's like going to the airport. The outside world is outside of the airport and everybody wants to get into the terminal. And before you can go from the outside world to the inside world, which is in the terminal, you have to go past the blue shirts through security. So that's what this is. The small intestines is that security area, kind of like the airport. And then once you get into the bloodstream, it should only be things that are safe. What is safe? Nutrition, broken down food products. Large undigested proteins are not necessarily considered safe. So the immune system is heightened and maybe these little Pac-Men gather around seeing if they have to attack anything here. Now, sometimes, and let's just go to the next page and kind of go through that. So the job of your immune system, your immune system has one job. It's to protect you. It's to protect you from the outside world, okay? So we need protection from the outside world. What is the outside world? It's anything we touch, anything we eat, anything we breathe. So if there's something in the air, the lining of my lungs have to protect me from those particles while still letting oxygen and CO2 pass through. We need to keep any pollutants or anything that's in the air out. Our skin is there to protect us from any surfaces that we touch. And then, of course, the lining of our GI tract protects us from what might be in our food. So there's nutrition in our food, but there might be some viruses and bacteria and things like that. So we need protection. Those protections are our barrier systems. So the lining of your lungs, your skin, and your gut. Okay, those are the barriers. If we disrupt these barriers, well then the inside world is in danger. So what happens when things from the outside world get into the inside world? Let's just take a virus, a cold virus, common cold virus. That is a long protein and a protein is made up of little particles. So let's just say the sequence of what makes up that protein has letters, right? We call those, um, there are 20 amino acids, and this is a, you know, think of them as like an alphabet. Let's just say the cold virus has a section that is, you know, A, G, F, L, Q, R, Z, 1. And then we have a food particle. Let's just call it gluten, because that's the big bad one on the block that everybody talks about. And that's B, R, Q, L, Q, R, P, X. And then we have thyroid protein. There are 80 to 100 known autoimmune disorders. They all work the same. Hashimoto's just happens to be the most common. And this one has a protein sequence that is totally different. Let's say it's X, P, Z, L, Q, R, G5. Okay. One thing the immune system knows is that it needs to attack the cold virus. And if it identifies this section of the protein, every time it sees it, it will attack it. But look, gluten has a section that has a similar sequence. The thyroid protein has a section that has a similar sequence. So the immune system, over time, when it's repetitively insulted, will say, you know what? That food particle looks a lot like that cold virus. I really can't tell the difference. I'm just going to attack both. And then we develop a food sensitivity. And then the immune system says, you know, that cold virus and that food particle and this, this other protein in the body, you know what? I really, j I can't tell the difference. I'm just going to attack all three. And now we have autoimmunity. This mechanism is called molecular mimicry. That's how we develop food sensitivities. That's how we develop autoimmunity. Pretty standard across the board. It's a basic layperson's understanding that's absolutely accurate. Okay, going back here, 
Those large undigested food particles activate the immune system. The immune system stays activated in the gut. There's disruption. What about this disruption here? What caused this disruption that allowed those particles into the bloodstream? Well, that disruption is anything that irritates your gut. And just think about the foods that you eat that could irritate your gut or the dysbiosis, right? The abnormal gut bacteria, we call that the microbiome. So we believe that autoimmunity and thyroid dysfunction starts here. Okay. With all that being said, the main thing to understand is that if you have gastrointestinal symptoms that are chronic, you're at risk. You know, gas, bloating, loose stool, diarrhea, irritable bowel, you're at risk for creating an autoimmunity. There are 80 to 100 known autoimmune disorders. There's probably that many unknown. You can have an autoimmune reaction to any part of your body. Most of those 80 to 100 autoimmune disorders are nuisances. They're not deadly. They cause, you know, for example, I have one called vitiligo. It's, you know, if I were African-American or a very dark complexion, you would see white blotches on my face and my elbow. And But I'm a general white guy. And if it's not August, you don't see it on me. So it's a nuisance autoimmunity. But for somebody else, it's cosmetically a problem. There are some autoimmunities that are quite deadly, like cancers, right? ALS and MS and these ty types of things. And those are less common. But then you have the ones that are medically a problem but are treatable, and that would be your Hashimoto's, and again, Hashimoto's being the most common. So one of the things we know is that when the immune system is activated, when the immune system is attacking you as if it's attacking a virus, right? You know, how much energy do you have when you're dealing with the flu? When your immune system is dealing with the flu, you just kind of lay in bed, and you're not solving any physics problems. You're just laying in bed, binge watching some television show, and waiting for your immune system to get on top of this. And that's because your immune system takes a lot of your energy resources to fight the virus. And once it's done fighting the virus, let's just say five, 10 days go by, you're done fighting the flu, you get all of your energy back and you go back to your life. But when you have an autoimmunity, your immune system is treating your own body as if it were the flu. So a lot of the energy resources are going to the immune system in perpetuity. It just keeps going on and on and on. And you're zapped for energy and you have weight gain and you have brain fog and you have almost the same symptoms as a, a dealing with a chronic virus. So the those same symptoms are hypothyroid symptoms, right? And then you go to your doctor and you say, check my thyroid because I got all these crazy thyroid symptoms and the doctor says your thyroid's fine, but they didn't check if you have the antibodies. So what if you have autoimmune antibodies that have not rendered your thyroid useless yet? You don't need thyroid medication, but you have many of the symptoms caused by autoimmunity that are almost the same as thyroid symptoms. So you go to a doctor, they check your thyroid antibodies, they're positive, but you're T4, T3, and TSH are still normal, but you're like, oh, I have Hashimoto's. I Google that, and that's hypothyroidism. I need thyroid medication. And then you start badgering your doctor to prescribe you thyroid medication when you don't need it, when your symptoms are caused by the autoimmune reaction and not necessarily a thyroid problem. Will it become a thyroid problem? Yes, certainly. But if you can create a better barrier between your food and your bloodstream, if you can get your immune system to calm down, well then those are the things that you can do through diet, through lifestyle. Now, there's a lot to cover here and we can't give a whole masterclass in thyroid hormone during this presentation. We are going to create some additional videos that go into what if TSH is normal, T4 is normal, but we're not converting to T3. Well, the most common cause of that is inflammation. So we wanna make sure that we can do that. We wanna make sure we have the micronutrients necessary to allow that T4 to T3 conversion to take place. And then it, you know, how do you heal the gut? How do you create a better barrier between your food and your bloodstream? And that, you know, can be anything from the autoimmune paleo style diet. People are doing great things with the carnivore diet. There are different options out there and there are some nutritional supplements that are very helpful. L-glutamine is a nutritional supplement that's, you know, kind of used at a high dose, you know, three to five grams a day where that L-glutamine can be used as a fuel to allow your intestinal cells to replicate. And that replication allows for those unhealthy the intestinal cells to be replaced by healthier intestinal cells. And then there's fasting. Fasting is another mechanism where you can stimulate what's called autophagy, where you get rid of old dysfunctional cells and replace them with new ones, and fasting can stimulate that process. So this is basically, you know, your brief layperson's masterclass on thyroid health. Please put in the comments any of the questions you may have or any topics that we've covered here that you'd like me to elaborate on.